Spring pool rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Spring pool rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not think you won't grow weary. In the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about the unity of that we all enjoy through the gospel. Kirk Brothers is president of Heritage Christian University, and in this lesson, he helps us reflect on how we were once each other's enemies, but now we are all together a sanctuary for our God. If you would, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. I'd like to begin by looking at verses 13 and 14. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. My family enjoys the television show Face Off. It's one of those competition shows, and this one, it is for aspiring professional makeup artists. And so you'll start with maybe 12 aspiring artists at the beginning of a given season, and each week they will be given tasks. And so they have to create makeups and prosthetics and costuming, etc., that fits with whatever the theme or task is for that week. And then at the end of their time, usually about a three day period, they'll have the reveal stage where they bring out their creations for the judges to see. And it's at that time that you have one of my favorite parts of the program. You will have this time lapsed video montage where they'll start with the actor and then at the end you will have the actor with all the prosthetics and makeup etc that have been created by the artist and so they will show you that process of transition from just the model to the final product. I think about when I was reading comics when I was a kid and you'd have that insert page that would show a, a, a kid on the beach and he's pictured as weak and being pushed around by the bullies, but then he'd either use this workout machine or take this supplement and he would get strong and he'd be the one that's pushing everybody else around. Or I think about maybe the, the commercials that maybe you've seen that involve some facial cream. So they'll show you know, what a person looks like without the facial cream and then what they look like with the facial cream. Those are all, all of those things I just described are before and after pictures. I say that to say this. Paul has two very important before and after pictures in Ephesians chapter 2. The theme phrase I use for the book of Ephesians is blessed in Christ to be like Christ. Paul is trying to motivate the, the brothers and sisters at Ephesus and in the surrounding churches to, to be faithful to Jesus and not be led away from Jesus. To motivate them to be faithful to Jesus and to live a godly lifestyle, he reminds them of all the blessings they have in Jesus. So the first half of the book of Ephesians is about the blessings they have in Christ, and the second half of the book is about being like Christ. So it's in that context of helping these Christians and us to see the blessings that come in Jesus Christ that we have these two before and after pictures in Ephesians chapter 2. In verses 1 through 10, we have the before and after picture for individual Christians. Before Christ, we were dead in our sins. After Christ, we've been raised up, made alive, and seated in heavenly places with Christ. He then, in verse 11, transitions from an individual before and after picture to a group 
before and after picture. That group would be Gentile or non-Jewish Christians. You can see in verse 11, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh. So what he's saying, Paul is writing as a Jewish Christian, and he's writing primarily to non-Jewish Christians, and he is reminding them of what life was like spiritually before Jesus, and telling and reminding them of what they now have after Jesus became a part of their lives. And again, he's stressing the blessings they have in Christ so that they will live lives like Christ, that they'll be motivated to stay faithful to Jesus and to live lives that honor him. So let's talk about what's going on here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Now, to understand what's going on here, we need to talk a little bit about the separation. Now, I read for you just a moment ago verses 13 and 14. And for me, those are really, really important verses. Verse 14 is a key, pivotal statement as he talks about Jesus breaking down the barrier, the dividing wall. So let's talk about the separation that existed at the temple in Jerusalem. If someone were to visit Jerusalem in the first century at the time Paul was writing this letter to Ephesus, they would have found degrees of access to God. You would have the, the, the temple mountain or the temple complex and only certain people could go into certain portions of the temple. So let's imagine that my iPad here is the, the main temple mount. Right here in the middle, you would have the holy place and most holy place, the main temple and its surrounding buildings. And so let's, let's imagine that the most holy place is kind of on the back of the complex closer to where I'm standing. That's where the most holy place would be. So when you came in that center complex, you would first enter the court of the Jewish women. This is where Jesus was when he saw the widow give her might. You then, once you went past that section and went a little closer to the most holy place or the Ark of the Covenant, you would enter into the court of the Jewish men. Now, Jewish women couldn't go into that section. If you went a little further, you would go into the area where they offered the sacrifices, where priests and Levites would go. Then from there, you would enter into the main sanctuary building, and it would be divided into two parts. The first part would be the holy place, where you would have the golden candelabra, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread. And not only... Did priests go there, and they were the only ones who could go into this section, but only select priests could go in there. An example of this would be in Luke chapter 1, where you find that Zacharias is going in to make sure that the fire is ignited and incense is rising from the incense altar. It would have been a very special privilege only given to a few. But then, ultimately, you would then have the most holy place, that chamber in which, for various periods of Israelite history, one could find the Ark of the Covenant. And only the high priest could go into that section, and he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement. So, court of the Jewish women, court of the Jewish men, area of the priests and Levites, area of select priests, and then the area that only the high priest could go into. And then out here in this open courtyard, you had this, this courtyard was called the Court of the Gentiles. You see, only the, the non-Jews could only go into the outer courtyard. They couldn't go into any of these inner buildings of the temple. And between that outer courtyard and those inner buildings, you would have had a wall. That wall had an inscription that was written in Greek and in Latin, and it warned non-Jews that if they crossed that wall, they would be responsible for their own death, which followed. So this wall was a very important wall, a very powerful and symbolic wall. It represented separation, the separation that existed not only between Jews and non-Jews, 
but especially between non-Jews and God. And to understand the significance of its power, we need to understand that the Roman government did not allow, generally speaking, for the Jews to practice capital punishment. That's why, for example, even though the, the chief priest had found Jesus guilty of blasphemy, they had to go to Pilate and get Jesus charged for treason in front of Pilate so that the Romans would execute him the Romans would not let the Jews execute someone for blasphemy, for claiming to be the Son of God. And so that's why Pilate had to put Jesus to death. So there was one exception. In other words, there was one circumstance in which the Romans would allow Jews to carry out capital punishment, which would have, in their culture, have been done by stoning. That one circumstance was violation of the barrier, the dividing wall. If a non-Jew crossed that wall, it looks like from reading ancient documents that the Romans allowed the Jews to practice capital punishment. So I just want us to realize that as Paul is trying to describe the separation that existed between non-Jews and God, not only the degrees of separation in the temple could illustrate that, but that wall in particular was symbolic of that separation. So as he's talking about their, their before and after picture, in the before picture, really the focus is on the idea of their being strangers to God. And so if you start looking there in verse 11, you're going to find that Paul's language is very, very intentional. Uh, he uses words that, that help them to remember that they were unknown to God. And because of that, they didn't have any hope. So, so look at words he used. He, he says they were uncircumcised. And the, the Jews refer to themselves as a circumcised. Circumcision was the mark of the covenant between God and Israel. Uh, even Actually, ultimately, a covenant between God and Abraham that extended to the nation of Israel. To say someone was uncircumcised was to say they were out of a relationship with God. It was basically Jewish, Orthodox Jew code language for you're lost eternally. So they said you are out of a relationship with God, separate, excluded, strangers, aliens, far off, enmity, without God. They're not only separated from Jews, and there's uh, animosity between Jews and Gentiles embodied in that dividing wall, but they're ultimately separated from God. And because they're separated from God, they do not have hope. So the before picture is you don't know God, and because of that, you do not know hope. He then is going to transition from the before hat picture of their being strangers to the after picture of their being sanctuaries. The transition happens with the phrase, but now, found there in verse 13. You have a similar transition that happens back up in verse 4 when he's talking about the individual before and after Christ. Before Christ, we're dead in our sins and we're by nature objects of wrath, he says, but God, because of his great mercy, and he talks about how God raised us up and made us alive and seated us in heavenly places with Christ. So he has a transition statement in both of these before and after, after pictures. So the before and after picture transitions right here in verse 13 when he says, but now. You, you were strangers before, but now everything has changed. And you're going to see different kind, uh, kinds of words here, a different language that is used here. So I want you to notice the difference. Words like near and peace and one. In the before picture, it says there was enmity, there was animosity. But now he says that has been put to death. He uses words like reconcile, together. He talks about having access one author has noted this word, translated access, was a, a word that might, for example, have been used in the ancient world for the idea of being given access to someone with power, like access to an emperor, access to a king. Uh, 
before they were strangers, before they were separated. But Jesus has given them access to God. Um, I'm reminded of the words of the Hebrew writer which says, Now let us draw near with confidence. Jesus has gone into the heavenly realm and has paved a path for us and has allowed us to draw near to God. And so you've got a transition that has taken place. And as he describes that after picture, right, he's playing, at least in part in the before picture, on what it would be like for them in Jerusalem, especially surrounding the temple sanctuary. Now he's going to continue to build off of that and play on that as he talks about the after picture. Because he's going to describe them, first of all, as becoming one new man. The picture here is that distinctions of race disappear. And no longer are they Jew or non-Jew. They become one new man. They become one new race in Jesus Christ. That Jesus not only brings them closer to God, it unites Jews and non-Jews, and that the church is made up of those who are Jews and those who are non-Jews, and we become one new people, one new nation, one new race. But then I also want you to notice that the, langu uh, the language that he uses. So then, verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Here Paul paints with, with words one of the most beautiful word pictures in Scripture. Before Jesus, when they went up to the temple in Jerusalem, they were strangers. They were separated from God. They could not get any closer to the Ark of the Covenant or the most holy place than that dividing wall of partition. But after Jesus, he says, Jesus broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. That's what he says in verse 14. Now that wall was physically still standing when Paul said that. He's not talking about the physical power of the wall. He's talking about the spiritual and emotional symbolic power of that wall. That wall does not separate. It won't separate in the future. And eventually, not many years after the writing of this letter, that wall would be torn down, and we only have fragments of it now. So they go from a status of if they went up to the temple, not being able to go into God. But he says when they entered into Christ Jesus, they... And Jews who were in Christ and all peoples who were in Christ were united together and together became a temple in which the Spirit of God dwells. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the church collectively is described as a temple of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, individual Christians are described as temples of the Spirit. And that's consistent with the description that we have here in Ephesians chapter 2. It's consistent with Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 where it says that believers are given the Spirit as a guarantee, a down payment, a seal of their inheritance. So think of what's going on here. Before, they could not go to God. But now in Christ Jesus, God has come to them. Before, they were separated from the most holy place. Now, as God's people, they have become the most holy place. For God lives in and among them. There are several takeaways we could take from this, but a couple stand out to me. First of all, is that Jesus made it possible for racial unity. Unity 
Basically, he's saying to them, all the things that used to divide you and separate you from the Jewish people should disappear in Jesus. He loves us all. He died for us all. We all have the same access to God. And together we become one new race in Jesus Christ. But he also reminds us here that in God we have hope. I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where Paul talks about, you know, there you've got folks who's, who have had loved ones who are Christians who have died and they're afraid they're going to miss the great parousia, the return of Jesus. And he tells them that we are not like the rest who have no hope. One of the greatest gifts God gave us is hope. And so we can be united with each other. We can be united with God. And because of that, we can have both peace and hope now and peace and eternal bliss with God in the hereafter. But let me tell you the rest of the story. You see, if we go to Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 35, we find that Paul went up to visit the temple in Jerusalem. He was falsely accused of taking someone across the dividing wall of partition. He didn't do it, but he was falsely accused. And because of that, he was drug out of the temple into what would have been the area of the court of the Gentiles, and they were beating him to death. And it's only because the commander of the fortress, Antonia, interfered that he was able to survive. But he ended up being arrested. He spent time in the fortress Antonia, then was transferred over to Caesarea, ultimately was transferred to Rome. And from Rome, he writes this letter to Ephesus. When he writes this letter, he's in prison because he was falsely accused of taking someone across the dividing wall. You know who it was he was falsely accused of taking into the temple? A man named Trophimus. You know where Trophimus was from? Ephesus. This church would have known that that wall was the reason Paul was in prison. And Paul used it as a powerful illustration to tell us that not only does Jesus tear down what divides races and nations, but Jesus tears down what divides us from God. They were strangers, but then they became a sanctuary. I hope we realize the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not fail.